with you. And also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Indeed, let us do so. Welcome to each and every one of you. A special welcome to those who are visiting with us this morning. We pray that uh, as we worship our God and as we fellowship as his people together, that we would indeed uh, receive his blessing, presence, and his encouragement in our hearts and in our lives. Just a couple of announcements I want to emphasize before we continue in worship this morning. Sunday school and catechism classes resume this morning. Uh, so uh, children, young people plan to stick around uh, after worship for those classes. Um, and then also, as you see in your uh, pink bulletin insert, um, uh, my wife and I are uh, anticipating, uh, Lord willing, and I say very much, uh, Lord willing, uh, going to Israel, um, departing this coming Saturday, um, confidently, cautiously optimistic uh, that we're going, uh, but we don't know that for certain yet, and hope to know for certain by Wednesday uh, is what we're told. And so either way, uh, if we go, fantastic, wonderful. If not, um, so be it, that's okay as well. Just so you know, we do have plans and preparations made for those next two Sundays, if indeed that does happen. We are here to worship our God, and so let us bow our heads and our hearts in a moment of silent prayer as we come before our God in worship. this first Lord's Day of the year 2019, and for all the days of our lives, may the grace of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our Counselor and Comforter, be with you all, now and forever. Amen. So God has welcomed us. Let us welcome one another in the joy of this day. Praise team comes forward to lead us in song and praise. Uh, hear this call to worship, uh, Jesus' last words to his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew before he presumably ascended back to heaven. Uh, Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the name not names, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We worship the name, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. Let us lift our hearts and voices together in song. Praise the Father, praise the Son.
worship our God. Um, this next song, I, I, I'm quite certain we've not sung here before, but it's pretty simple, pretty easy. Uh, it's short, and we're going to sing it through two times. Um, and, and as we do, and you'll hear some familiar lines in this, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Uh, you'll recognize that. Uh, but I want you to envision, imagine, if you will, if you can, um, and, and maybe even do so if you're comfortable doing so, with, with your hands outstretched, something like this, uh, that grace is flowing down even as we worship. It's always flowing down, grace upon grace upon grace. And as we sing this song, just receive God's grace. What a beautiful, what a glorious picture, what a beautiful, what a glorious thought to know yourself and to see yourself as covered, covered, covered in grace, grace that covers and wipes away all of our sins and all of our iniquities uh, as if they never existed just as if we've never sinned nor even been sinners, grace covers me, and it covers you, and it's sufficient, it's sufficient to save us, it's sufficient to sanctify us, and it will be sufficient to glorify us. Friends, that's good news. That's good news worth us celebrating this day and every day, and because of that good news that we are covered in God's grace, uh, we are free. We're free to live for God. We're free to live for his glory. We are free and empowered to live as God desires us to live. Um, which is different than how we would live if left to ourselves and on our own. God reveals his will for our lives throughout all of scripture. But he very specifically and especially reveals his will, a summary of his will for our lives in the Ten Commandments, the law of God. Uh, this law can't save us. It can't. It won't. Because we can't and we won't and we don't measure up to it. We, do, we cannot and we do not obey these commands all the time and all and in every way. We cannot and we do not. And yet as those who are covered in grace, we can begin 
we can begin to obey these commands, and we certainly can grow in obedience to these commands. And as we do, we find that these commands are delightful, that they're for our good and for God's glory. This is God's will for our lives and also very much our guide for grateful living as those who are covered in grace. People of God hear his will for our lives and our guide for grateful living. The Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. Wonderful words to begin a new year with. Wonderful words to strive for. Wonderful words to desire to be to be growing in our hearts and our lives. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy six days. You shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. People of God, this is God's will for our lives, a summary of it. And serves also as our guide for grateful living. As I think you're well aware, each, each of those commands that begin with, you, you shall not, don't, right? There's a positive intent behind each of those and a positive alternative. Don't do this, but rather do this. And when you do this, you'll find life. You will. Trust me, God says. It's true. And so may God, by his word and by his Holy Spirit at work within us, empower us in the year, this new year, 2019, and increasingly throughout all of our days to live in obedience to these commands, commands which are for our good and for God's glory. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we come before our God in prayer this morning as his people. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, great and glorious God, one True, the only living God, the only God who saves, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we've sung already this morning, we praise you. We praise your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons, three in one, distinct and yet united in perfect harmony. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise your name. We praise you for all your marvelous acts in creation and in redemption and in salvation. We praise you for your ongoing provision and providence in this world and in our lives. We praise you for every good gift that we receive from you, Father, our fa the Father of lights and of all good gifts. We praise you not only for material blessings, for sustenance, for food and shelter and clothing, but we praise you even more so for every spiritual blessing that is ours. In Jesus Christ, indeed, in him we lack nothing, and in him we have everything that we need for life and for death and for all eternity. God, we thank you that you are a gracious God, that you are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast, unfailing love. You do not hold our sins, our iniquities against us, but you forgive 
And you do so at great cost to yourself because you demonstrated your great love for us. And while we were yet sinners and yet still dead in our sins, slaves to sin, without hope, you sent and gave your son Jesus Christ who died for us and paid that costly price for our sins, the price we could never pay on our own, that we might be free to love you and serve you and obey you and delight in you and find life in you. Indeed, we thank you not only for our temporary lives, it's you who created us, formed and fashioned each one of us in our mother's wombs, ordained all of our days even before one of them came to be, but even more so, we thank you for eternal life that we shall live and live in the fullness of joy and the fullness of your presence long, 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 long after our temporary lives are over. Indeed, as we heard from your word last week, as is echoed throughout Scripture, our temporary lives, whether they are 40, 50, or 100 years here on earth and in these mortal bodies, they are but a breath, but a mist, but a vapor. They quickly pass and they are gone and we fly away. And so God, teach us, as you declare through the psalmist, teach us to, to rightly number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. Help us to know and see and focus on not what is temporary, but what is eternal. God, help us to encounter here this morning again what is eternal. You, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your, your word which is living and breathing and active. The grass will wither and the, the flowers will fade, but your word will last and stand forever. God, help us to see your kingdom that is already here, inaugurated through the first coming of Jesus Christ, his first advent, and help us to see and look forward to with eager anticipation the kingdom that is coming in all of its fullness when Jesus comes again at his second advent, his second coming, when he comes to make all things new. God, we thank you for the rhythm and the routine uh, that you have ordained for us and for the creation, that this would be a, a Sabbath day of rest and worship and fellowship, that we would rest from our physical labors, but that we would also spiritually rest in you and in your word and in your promises and in the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ, and find that true and that lasting and that ultimate rest in you, in your word, and in your character, and in your promises. God, we thank you for the honor and the blessing and the joy and the privilege and the opportunity that it is to worship you. Indeed, it's all of those things and more. God, help us indeed to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to know you uh, as you reveal yourself according to your word, not as we would, would desire you to be or fashion you to be in our, in our, in our depravity and in our, in our flesh and in our sin. God, help us to really seek you and really know you as you are, as you reveal yourself. God, we make idols not necessarily out of physical things, although we do and we can. But just as much so, more, we make idols out of non-physical things. We make you into an image of who you are not at all. Or we make ourselves an idol. We make ourselves our, our number one priority in life. Or the pursuit of, of things, of material possessions. God, we make idols in all kinds of ways. Even good things and good gifts that you give us, we can make idols of. God, help us to worship you and you alone. Help us to, above all, love you and serve you and reflect that love and that service by loving and serving our neighbor, which includes our neighbor certainly gathered around us right here in this place and in your church. God, we thank you uh, in, as we begin, as we've begun this new year of 2019 and on this first Lord's Day of 2019, thank you for your word. Thank you for the summary of your will for our lives and the Ten Commandments, our guide for grateful living. Help us to be intentional and help us to be obedient to your commands with your help in this coming year and throughout our lives that more and more we might delight in you, 
Delight in your will. Delight in, in your commands. And know that they are not burdensome, that they are for our good and for your glory. They are for our delight in walking in right relationship and right fellowship with you. God, help us to grow in obedience in this coming year. We all, myself included, fall very, very short of your goodness and grace and glory each and every day. We sin each and every day in thought and in word and in deed by the things that we do and also by the things that we fail to do. We're a sinful people. God, we confess that, that truth in honesty and transparency this day. None of us have yet arrived. None of us uh, are righteous in and of ourselves, but in this place, while we declare that we indeed are sinful and remain sinful and continue to sin, we declare also that we are righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to us, applied to us, given to us, so that as you look at us and see us as we are united to Christ, you see us as perfect and holy and righteous even as Jesus is perfect and holy and righteous, and that's really good news. That's really good news to know that you have done that for us and that you see us that way and that you love us that much to have made us clean and right with you. And so God, help us to desire to grow in this st righteous standing. Help us to be sanctified and to participate in your work of sanctification in us. We claim your promise that you who began a good work in us, you are faithful to continue and complete that good work until and for the day of Christ Jesus and his return. Indeed, we declare in this place and in your church here that salvation is of you, God, and of you alone. From start to finish and everywhere in between, we claim no credit. We are merely beneficiaries of your goodness and your glory and your grace. And as we have sung in that beautiful little song, we declare in this place with comfort and with joy that grace covers us. And grace continues to cover us. And you continue to pour out grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace in our lives. Your grace has no expiration date no term limit, and it cannot and will be exhausted, and we will enjoy your grace, your kindness, your benevolence, your favor, not only for the rest of our lives, but for the rest, for all of eternity, we will enjoy your grace, your amazing grace for sinners like us, for wretches like us. And so thank you for grace. Thank you indeed that you are a gracious God. Help us then to, 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 to receive that grace here in this place again this morning. As we hear that good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that in him grace covers us. God, we pray for each one gathered here this morning. You know the circumstances and places from where we've come. The things that we're dealing with in life, be they matters of health. Uh, or sickness, be they matters of relationships and relationship concerns within our families and circles of friends or co-workers. You know what's going on spiritually within us. Nothing is hidden from you. You know what temptations we face. You know our areas of weakness and struggle. And you love us. Not as we should be. Not as one day we will be, but you love us as we are through Jesus Christ. And because you love us, you desire for us to not stay where we're at, but to grow. To grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we even just a little bit this day and this hour grow in your grace. Lord, we pray for those who... Of our, of our membership, of our church family and the body of Christ here that cannot be with us this morning um, or any other Sunday mornings for that matter for our elderly and for our shut-ins. We pray for Elmer Bunnema at Crown Point this day. We pray for Adrian Cride at his home this day. And we pray for Siebert Van Der Esch at, at Oak Hill in Haywarden this day. 
Uh, Lord, he grows weaker, uh, seemingly by the day, uh, and yet you sustain him. Uh, his vitals, his, his heart, his breathing, his lungs, his kidney function. Um, he, he continues to receive nourishment a little bit, enough anyway. Lord, you sustain him even as he grows weak and he's, even as his body fades. You sustain him and you will sustain him. Lord, comfort him with your presence this day and whatever, how many days he has left, it seems that if the, the number of those days is near, uh, comfort his wife, Christina, by his side and their children scattered around the country. Uh, Lord, we just entrust him to you and we take joy and confidence and comfort in knowing that he belongs to you in body and soul and life and in death and he, should, he soon shall receive his eternal reward through the finished work of Christ. He soon shall be brought to the fullness of joy in your presence in heaven he soon will have his faith become sight and see the Savior who lived for him and died for him and rose again for him. And what a wonder, what a glory that will be even as his family and friends and we as church family, uh, that time will come when we will grieve his death. But we will do so with great joy and great hope that in that moment, even as we grieve, he will be alive and well and in your presence in the fullness of joy. And that we'll see him again, fully restored perfect in you one day soon. And so God be with Siebert this day, be with his family. Uh, Lord, I ask your blessing uh, as Arla and I have anticipated now for a couple of years and increasingly recently anticipated the, the possibility uh, of perhaps going to, to Israel, uh, this land where so much uh, of your story and the, the story of your people, our story, where so, of it, so much of that story took place in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, God, we just pray your blessing upon Cliff Graham, our tour guide and organizer of uh, this potential trip. Um, we pray that if it be your will, that he would be able to go and uh, that we would be able to go. And in doing so, that we would, uh, that we would be blessed and encouraged and that we would be amazed and marvel at uh, your story of redemption, not only in Israel, but all around the world, and especially so in our lives. God, if it be your will, uh, we so anticipate going, and if it's not your will at this time, uh, then so be it. That's okay. Uh, Lord, your will be done. And may your will be done in all of our lives in this coming year, and may we say along with James from your word that we heard last week, uh, may we say if it's your will, this year and each day we will live and do this or that. God, may your will uh, be at the focus and forefront of our minds, of our plans, of our preparation, of our daily work, uh, and not our own purposes and not our own plans. May we submit to you. May we humble ourselves before you throughout this coming year and throughout our lives. Lord, we thank you uh, in this day that around your church we celebrate what's called Epiphany. A word perhaps we're not terribly familiar with. It means manifestation or appearance. Your church all around the world this day, in many places at least anyway, is, is celebrating the manifestation and the appearance of Jesus Christ in his incarnation, which we celebrated again at Christmas. His birth, his becoming human, his becoming like us in absolutely every way, except that he, was ne that he never sinned, though he was tempted like us in every way. God, we thank you for your perfect plan of redemption and for Jesus' cooperation in that plan by which he, though fully God, would become fully human like us so that he might be that perfect mediator, the only sufficient Savior. God, thank you for, for providing in Jesus one sure way, one sure life, and one sure truth by which we, through him, may come to you, our Heavenly Father. And so help us again to come to you this day by faith. Help us to receive your son, Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord. And in receiving him, know that we indeed are your children for this life and for the life to come. God, thank you for each, of, each one of your children gathered here in this place. Give us eyes to see you rightly. And give us eyes to see each other as your dearly loved children. Lord, we know that in this place, even as we... Uh, at the end of this service, anticipate celebrating the Lord's Supper together. We know that in this place, 
there, there is a history among some of us, uh, amongst most of us. Uh, there are grievances that have happened in the past amongst some of us, perhaps many of us. Uh, there are matters of which we still perhaps hold grudges uh, and bitterness and anger towards some of us here. And that has no place in our hearts. For we who are forgiven are called to forgive. And you enable us by your power to forgive. And so even as we anticipate celebrating the Lord's Supper within this hour of worship, help us to look around this place, this sanctuary, and our brothers and our sisters in Christ and free us from any bitterness, from any anger, from any grudges that we might have towards one another. Help us to forgive as you have freely forgiven us. And release that burden, and in doing so, be free. God, thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for your presence always in our lives. Thank you for your presence in a special way here as we worship you. And we thank you in advance for your presence in a special way in the bread and in the juice, in the celebration of the Lord's Supper as we receive these common elements by faith and by faith as they are to us the very body and the very blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May we be nourished and strengthened in receiving and partaking of the body and blood of Christ this day. And may we be received in blessing and partaking of your word prior to God, we thank you for your presence with us always to the very end of the age in your presence here with us now in this place. Hear now our prayer. We pray these things in the precious name of your Son and our Savior and Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn then with me to the Gospel of John this morning. In the Gospel of John, uh, the, what's called the prologue to the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. And we will read the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John. Today, as you heard in prayer, if you heard it, uh, today in the liturgical calendar, or the, the calendar of the church year uh, around the world, including here in our country as well, uh, not all, but many churches uh, acknowledge today, the first Sunday of the new year, uh, as what's called Epiphany Sunday. Epiphany is a word that comes from a Greek word meaning manifestation or appearance. Uh, in church history, this word epiphany has become closely associated with the revelation of Jesus Christ uh, in connection with the visit of the, the Magi, the three wise men, the Magi, whomever they were, wherever they came from. Uh, how, how, there may not necessarily have been three, there might have been well more, um, and this was probably a, a year or two or three after the birth of Jesus. Um, and so that's the passage often that gets told and, and proclaimed on this day. Uh, but as I thought about Epiphany, the manifestation, the appearance, the incarnation of Jesus, I was drawn uh, to John and by the Holy Spirit, his words here at the Gospel of John. So hear the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. 
From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. But God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. I encourage you to keep your Bibles open as we consider this passage just a, a bit further this morning. This passage, the prologue to John's gospel, serves as an excellent summary of what we call epiphany, the manifestation or the appearance of Christ in his incarnation. And the incarnation of Jesus Christ is, though he was fully God from eternity past, his becoming human at his birth, at his conception and birth, is a really, really, really big deal. It's a really, really big deal. And John, in in verse 14 of of this passage, gets right to the heart of Epiphany, right to the heart of the Incarnation, when he says, and I just, I wanted this morning, uh, this passage we've just read, we we could, I think I could rightly give a year full of sermons on on this passage that we've just read for a full year, no problem. There's so much here to dwell on and meditate on and receive that is echoing themes throughout not only the rest of John's gospel, but throughout the whole of Scripture. There's a lot here. And there's just no way that in 15, 20 minutes' time we could take this all in this morning. I want to just hone in on one verse this morning, verse 14. It gets to the heart of Epiphany, and I think even just this one verse standing alone by itself with echoes of the rest of Scripture all around it, not only uh, gives us a really good word of the Lord, but it also really, I think, points to the celebration of the Lord's Supper that we will soon celebrate. Verse 14. I just want to emphasize three things within this verse 14 for us to dwell on, to receive as we prepare to come to the table of grace this morning. Number one, the Word became flesh. The Word here, obviously, and John uses this Word from the very beginning of this passage throughout this prologue. Uh, Here in verse 14, this is the last time that he uses this, what's the Greek word, logos. And this is a very direct reference to the eternal Son of God, who, who, though perhaps to many Christians in reading their Bible seems like The Son of God has his beginning here as he's born of the Virgin Mary. Oh no, that's not the beginning of the Logos of the Son of God of Jesus Christ. John says in his passage in the prologue here, he was in the beginning, he he was God and he was with God. He was with God in the beginning. The incarnation of Jesus Christ is not the beginning for him. He has always existed. And here for the last time, John in verse 14 uses this Greek word, Logos, translated rightly, the word, the word became flesh, fully human, though yet fully God, and made his dwelling among us. This is a really big deal, friends, that the word, that Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Greek word behind made his dwelling here is not a terribly common or uh, or often occurring Greek word in the New Testament. The Greek word tr- we translate in this Bible, made his dwelling, uh, it's skeno. Skeno. There, that's better pronunciation. Skeno. It means to tent. It's a verb. To tent or encamp or occupy or reside with. The, the, the word, the logos, became flesh, became human, and skeno made his tent, his encampment, his occupying, his residing among us. This is a great word. This this Greek word, skeneo, only occurs five times in the New Testament, but this is a really, really important concept and a really big deal, and it points back to centuries before in the Old Testament. Skeneo, to, to tent or encamp with to occupy or reside with. The NIV here translates this word, made his dwelling. The ESV and the King James versions translate this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, The NRSV, the word became flesh and lived among us. Uh, 
uh, a newer translation called the New English Translation. This is a good one. Uh, the Word became flesh and took up residence with us and among us. And then I, I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. It's not a translation. It's a paraphrase. But I love Eugene Peterson's, the message paraphrase here. He, he renders this, skeno, oh, the Word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Yours and mine. Even the very neighborhood of our hearts. He moved in. He moved into the neighborhood. He took up residence among us and in us and with us. He made his dwelling among us. Friends, this is a really, really big deal. You could render skeno'o, the word became flesh, and maybe you've heard this before. You could render this word, the word became flesh, and tabernacled among us. Because at the heart and the root of this word is a thinking back on the Apostle John's part. He was Jewish, you know. He's thinking back to the Old Testament tabernacle, which housed the very presence and glory, the Shekinah of God for, for a long time with God's people. I think you got a slide or two here for me, Derek, if you can see that. So here's an a illustration, a, a rendering of the Old Testament tabernacle. It was a tent, and literally called the tent of meeting. This is where the glory of God and the presence of God dwelled in a really special and tangible way. And of course, you know, uh, beyond the, the Holy of Holies to the left side of the screen there, th that, that's where the, 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 the Shekinah, the glory of God, dwelt in a really special way. You couldn't even go back there unless you were the high priest that one time of the year because you couldn't see the glory of God in all of its fullness and live. And now John is saying, the word became flesh and made his dwelling, his tabernacle amongst us. Jesus is the replacement of this tabernacle, and, and next slide, Derek, and the, te the, the temple that came after it. Solomon's temple, and again, here you see, as the high priest stands, there before the cherubim and the seraphim, the glory of God dwelled in the temple. But John is telling us in Jesus Christ, now the word has become flesh and made his dwelling among us and with us and in us, took up residence among us and with us and in us, moved into our neighborhood and moved into our lives. And this is a really, really, really big deal. Five occurrences of this Greek verb, skeno'o, to tent or encamp, occupy or reside with, to tabernacle among us. And this is a beautiful truth to embrace and latch on to, friends. Like I said, skeno'o is only referenced five times in the New Testament. Once here in John, the other four occurrences of this Greek verb skeno'o are, are in the last book of the Bible in Revelation. I want to share just two of those references with you because they pick up on this theme. Revelation chapter 7 Right? Where, where John, same John, same John on the island of Patmos as an old man, several years after he presumably wrote this gospel by the Holy Spirit, he's on the island of, of Patmos in captivity, and he has a vision uh, essentially of the throne of God and of heaven. In Revelation chapter 7, we're reading there that he sees this great multitude that no one could count, people from every tribe and tongue and language and nation. And we read in, in Revelation 7, verse 15, and this is talking about the people of God. They, as John sees them in this vision, the saints, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will skeno'o over them, spread his tent over them. The last reference to skeno'o, Revelation 21, verse 3. John receives this, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the skene, this is the noun, skene tent, now the tent, the dwelling of God is with man and he will skeno'o with them, he will live with them. It's this idea that in Jesus Christ, God 
has replaced the, the tabernacle, he's replaced the temple, and in Jesus Christ, he has come to dwell with us, make his dwelling among us, with us and in us, take up residence among us, with us, in us, move in to our neighborhood, move in to our hearts and to our lives. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Second thing to emphasize from verse 14, John says, and he's speaking here, I think, on, on behalf of himself and, and the other disciples, the apostles, and, and, and all, who, all who physically saw Jesus. And we know from the Apostle Paul, in first, in, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 15, that after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his resurrection from the dead, there were more than 500 witnesses at one time who saw the resurrected, risen Christ. And that, that's, the, that's Ayrton. That many people at once. John says collectively, I think, on behalf of the apostles and all who physically saw Jesus, but also saw him with eyes of faith. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father. John saw him, friends. He saw him. He walked with him for three years. He, he, John saw the glory of Jesus in his life and in his ministry. And in his miracles, John saw the glory of Jesus in his suffering and in his death. He was there at Calvary. John saw the glory of Jesus in the resurrected, risen Lord. And he saw the glory of Jesus when he ascended on the cloud back to heaven. John, with his physical eyes, saw the glory of Jesus up front, in person, up close and personal. But we too, I, I pray, I trust, I hope, have seen the glory of Jesus. No, we've not seen him physically like Peter says. Though you have not seen him, you love him. No, you still don't see him. You believe in him. Right? I pray that we all can say, I've seen the glory of Jesus. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, and he's speaking to the, the church, the believers in Corinth, but he's speaking to all of God's people who have ears to hear this and faith to receive this, for it's true of us as well. Paul writes in, first, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You see, friends, we too can see the glory of Jesus. Though we don't see him physically like John did, though we, didn't, though we don't walk with him in person, Jesus is no less with you and I. His glory no less with you and I than when he was physically with his disciples for three years. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. To see Jesus is to see the glory of God. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, right before he goes to the cross, right before his betrayal and arrest and, and impending crucifixion, in John chapter 17, the whole thing is a prayer of Jesus. He prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and then he prays for all who would believe in him. And part of his prayer for those who in the future would, by God's sovereign grace and electing love, would believe in him, Jesus prays this, amongst other things, for those who in the future, at that time, in the future, would believe in him. John 17, verse 24, Jesus says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. I want those you have given me to see my glory, to see it, behold it, and embrace it. I want those you have given me to see my glory. God, give us eyes to see and hearts to believe that we have, and we do even now, and we one day in all of its fullness will see the glory of Jesus. Give us eyes to see that glory now. The face of Jesus Christ. 
the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full, full, full of grace and truth. Here is the one in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, the glory of God embodied, who is full of grace and who is full full of truth. And we need both, friends. Not one or the other, and not one more than the other. We need grace, and we need truth. And Jesus is full of both grace and truth. Scholars here, where John says that Jesus is full of grace and truth, Scholars, almost every one of them that I read, every commentary, every study Bible, almost every one of them, when John says Jesus is full of grace and truth, they point back to the God revealed in the Old Testament and to the Hebrew word that's, that, we, that we know as what's called hesed. And it's often translated a variety of ways, steadfast love, unfailing love. In the New Testament, hesed essentially becomes what we know to be grace, kindness, favor, benevolence of God. Every scholar that I read agreed seemingly that when John says Jesus is full of grace and truth, it, they mean to say that Jesus is the embodiment of the God of the Old Testament who is hesed, who is kind and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jesus is full of grace and truth. He is the embodiment of God's love and God's faithfulness. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of of grace and truth. So what's this, what's this verse got to do with the Lord's Supper? I think it's got everything to do with the Lord's Supper. You see, friends, as we celebrate and partake of the Lord's Supper, God is reminding us and assuring us that in Jesus, He has indeed made His dwelling among us taken up residence among us and with us and in us. Indeed, in Jesus Christ, he has moved right into the neighborhood of our hearts and of our lives. In our celebration and partaking of the Lord's Supper, God is showing us in a really tangible, physical way, in the bread and in the juice that we can see and touch and taste and actually consume, God is showing us the glory of the one and only, His beloved Son, our Savior. And in our celebration and partaking of the Lord's Supper, God is strengthening us in faith and hope and love in a tangible way physical demonstration of his love for us and his faithfulness to us in the bread and in the cup. The word became flesh and dwelled among us. We have seen and we continue to see his glory here in the word and the scriptures and we continue to see his glory in this table of grace. In this feast of remembrance and of communion and of hope. And we receive God's love and God's faithfulness as we gather around this table. This time I'll invite the elders to come forward as we prepare to partake and celebrate of the Lord's Supper. As we prepare to do so, let us sing the first verse of Behold the Lamb.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. bread which we break is a communion with, a participation in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a communion with, a participation in the God who in Jesus Christ has made his dwelling among us, taken up residence with us and in us, and moved into our neighborhood. Take, eat, remember and believe that the precious body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. same way after supper Jesus took the cup he gave it to his disciples and said this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me
cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks is a communion with the participation and a sharing in the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's a communion with and a participation in and a sharing in the truth that God in Jesus Christ has made his home amongst us. It is a participation and a sharing in the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It is a participation in and a sharing in Jesus Christ who is full of of grace and truth. So take, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we thank you for all of your good gifts, but most of all, for the greatest gift of all, the gift of yourself and your Son, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our Savior, our Lord, and our King. God, may we, by your word and by your spirit, have truly partaken of Jesus this morning, of his body and of his blood and the bread and in the cup, and that in doing so, that we would, along with John, declare that in Jesus Christ, you have made your home among us and with us and in us, and that in Jesus Christ, we see your glory, and in him we see the one, the embodiment of you, the face of God, is full of grace and full of truth, the one in whom we have complete, complete, complete forgiveness, of all our sins. We thank you, God, for the gift of your Son and the forgiveness and the life and the salvation we have in him. Receive our thanksgiving, receive our praise, receive our lives as we continue to walk by faith until that glorious day when we see your glory in all of its fullness, when we see our Savior face to face, the one who loved us and lived for us and died for us and rose again for us. God, until that day, help us to see Jesus clearly in your word and help us to walk with him by faith. We pray this in his name and for his glory. Amen. In response to being fed by God's word and at the table of grace, the deacons will receive our tithes and gifts and offerings, our thanksgiving uh, this morning's offerings, two of them, first for Classis Iacota Ministry Shares, the second for Atlas Orange City area. Just want to uh, mention that in your mailboxes this morning, you may have grabbed it already, may not have, um, but it's a, a summary of where Classis Iacota Ministry Shares go to. It's numerous things, um, and it tells you the, the dollar or the cents amount. Um, for 2019, every confessing, professing member of our church is assessed a total of $113.88 uh, for Classis Iacota ministry shares, and this is how they are, that, that $113 is divided up. And so that's just for your information. Deacons will receive the offerings at this time.
praise team to come forward to lead us in song as we respond to being fed by God's word and, and at his table of grace. Uh, let us sing together uh, the doxology and praise God who has saved not only our souls, but our bodies as well. Let us stand and sing. receive God's parting blessing. Our God in Jesus Christ has made his dwelling, his home, his residence among us. Our God in Jesus Christ has revealed his glory to us, and our God in Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth to us. And so grow. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be all glory, all power, all authority, all majesty, both now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.